All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA task list series. Today we're continuing C4 with temporal dimensions of behavior, including duration, latency, and into response time. So we are looking at temporal extent and temporal locus. Behavior happens across time and it happens at certain points in time. So that's what we'll be covering today. More fundamental continuous measurement procedures. As always, like, subscribe if you haven't already. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. Let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. All right, quick review of our dimensional quantities. Remember, all of our measurements are derived from these dimensional quantities. So first, we have repeatability, which we did last week. Behavior can be counted, right? Frequency, we're just counting up behaviors. Pretty straightforward. We're going to cover temporal extent and temporal locus today. So temporal extent is duration. Behavior occurs during an amount of time, across time, however you want to look at it. And then temporal locus. Behavior occurs at a certain point in time relative to other events. So latency and into response time. In the practice of ABA, you likely won't ever use this type of language because you're going to be talking about duration and rate and frequency of latency and IRT. But for the exam and as an analyst, you need to know where we get those things. Remember, we're still covering a lot of the foundational material, which is going to support all these other things we're going to talk about later on. Get the foundation right, and the other stuff becomes a lot easier. So continuing, let's get to duration. So duration is temporal extent. Simply the amount of time from the onset, meaning the start, to the offset, meaning the end, of a response. In other words, how long did the learner engage in the response? If I tap my pencil for five seconds, what is my duration? Five seconds. So duration is, is pretty straightforward, right? As long as you have a pretty clear onset and offset, you can take duration on behavior. Now, we want to be careful, as always, when we're choosing our measurements. If behavior is happening rapidly and the onset and offset is half a second, a second, duration might not be the best. That being said, duration is still good for high rate behaviors. And we're going to look at why. So duration can measure things like if a learner is engaged for too long or too short of a time period. So typically with duration, we're going to be trying to increase or decrease the, the time engaged or the time engaged in the response. Duration is appropriate for behaviors that occur at high rates. And this is important to point out because when we think about repeatability and count and rate, those aren't always great for high rate behaviors. And why? Well, if you get some kids who engage in behaviors 50, 60, 70, 80 times per minute or every five minutes, it can get really difficult to go through that count. So what we can try to do is take some sort of total duration per, se per session where we're looking at all these behaviors and we're timing how long they last throughout our entire session. So if I've got a three-hour session, I'm going to time how long they engage in these behaviors, and that's going to be my total duration per session. So my total duration per session might be an hour out of the three hours they were engaged in those responses. That can, that might be easier than counting individual responses. On the other hand, you can absolutely take each occurrence and look at the duration per occurrence. So time for each individual response. This might be good if you're looking for, let's say, an average, because if I have 10 occurrences and I can take the duration per occurrences, I can then quickly find some sort of average or, or total. So there's different ways to use duration. Remember, we choose measurement based on our goals and based on the behaviors we're observing. So don't ever think we have to use a certain measurement. It's just what's going to give you the most accurate, valid, and reliable data and what's going to be most reasonable and realistic for actually taking that data. So question, duration is derived from what dimensional quantity? Duration is derived from A, temporal extent, yes. B, temporal locus, no. Temporal locus is our inter-response time and latency. And then C, repeatability is our frequency and our counts. And so duration is derived from A, temporal extent. Duration, rather straightforward. Now, latency and inter-response time. We're going to start with latency, and these are probably the two most complicated, I would say, continuous measurement procedures. Um, they're very closely related. I just think when you're first starting out, maybe you're just starting to study or you're starting classes or wherever you're at in your program, these can be a little hard to internalize. So let's look at it like this, right? First, latency, time between the onset of a stimulus. Let's just call that the SD, right? SD is presented and the start of a response. And that's the key here. We're looking for the start 
of a response. So if we look at our little diagram down here, right? We have an SD, we have a response one, we have response two, we have response three. Right here is our latency, okay? The time in between the onset of that stimulus and the start of this response is our latency. So latency can measure the time between the opportunity to engage in a behavior and when that behavior starts. For example, somebody's not answering questions quick enough. Somebody's not getting out of bed soon enough. Uh, there's a list goes on and on, right? Somebody is taking too long to start their work. Somebody is taking too long to start their meal. Or maybe latency's too short and we need some longer latencies, right? It all depends, again, on what our goal is. Simply put, though, latency is the time in between, keyword in between, the SD and the start of the first response. Not time in between responses, the time in between the SD and the start of the first response. Latency is often reported as a range, an average, or a median. Which is, what does that mean? What means you want to take multiple measurements of latency? We don't just want one measurement of latency and call it a day. Get 5, 10, 15 measurements, and let's get a range. Let's get an average. It's going to tell us a lot more about the behavior. So question, the time it takes for you to roll out of bed after your alarm clock rings is considered what? So when we're answering latency questions, let's find the onset, and that would be our alarm clock ringing. So that's our SD. So our latency is going to be time in between the SD and the response. The response is rolling out of bed. So whatever the time in between these two things is, is our latency. And so the time it takes for you to roll out of bed after your alarm clock rings is considered B, latency. Now, on the other hand, we have enter response time or IRT. And this is the amount of time between two consecutive responses. So looking back at our diagram, right? We have SD response one. What is that? Well, that's our latency. And then we have response one, response two, response two, response three. And so now we're looking at from the end of response one to the start of response two. And what do we call that? IRT. And then we have the end of response two, start of response three. We have IRT. And that's the difference, okay? And so when we're looking at the amount of time in between two consecutive responses, you really want to try and measure functionally equivalent responses or responses in the same response class. It just makes more sense, right? Because if I'm measuring the IRT between taking a bite of food and doing math homework at school, I'm not really sure what that's telling us. Again, it's all guided by our goals and what we're trying to achieve. But typically, you're going to be measuring functionally equivalent responses or responses in the same response class. So short enter response times often indicate high rates of response, while long enter response times often indicate low rates of response. So just think about this little diagram here for latency and enter response time. Question, Gordon annoys his sister to no end. He will open his door when it is closed. Then 20 minutes later, he will run in and steal something from her room. And then 10 minutes later, he will start tapping on the door until she answers. What is measured here? So what do we have? Well, we have Gordon annoying his sister. Okay, so how, when is he doing this? Well, he opens the door when it's closed, right? So that's response one. 20 minutes later, runs and steals, some, runs and, and steals something. Response two, here's our IRT. 10 minutes later, response three, right? Or starts tapping on the three door is response three. And then this is our enter response time. And so you can see, right, how we can break these questions down in manageable chunks. Now, once you get good at this, right, and you get really quick and you've done it a lot and you're fluent, you don't need to do that. But while you're starting to study, especially if these things aren't intuitive, go through that process. It's all about putting in the time and work to get to that point well, you can read this question and you don't have to go through all that. You just immediately know, okay, we've got enter response time. So that is our temporal dimensions of behavior, duration, latency, and enter response time. Again, time-based measurement procedures, more continuous fundamental measurements, and we're continuing through C4. Well, C5 will be coming um, next week or maybe sooner. So make sure you watch to the end of the video to click on C5 and get there. As always, like, subscribe, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Let us know when you pass. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.